which will help us get information about this degenerative scoliosis which is a very deep uh, topic uh, just in brief and in a simplified manner so it's a, a very small group meeting so everyone will be very free to discuss any doubts that come up during even during the meeting to stop any one of us in the middle and ask any questions or doubts and to feel free whenever they want to. Uh, so, Abhay sir, anything specific you need to add? Anything. This? Just a topic that has intrigued everyone and it's a big enigma in our heads. So, we're trying to declutter it and try to break it down to make it as simple as possible. But even at that point, many of the speakers or the presenters may not have understood it fully and you may not understand it fully also. So, it's a good time for us to iron out every uh, little hitch that is there in our heads uh, and discuss with each other because I'm sure everyone will bring in some uh, value to the meeting. So, we have segregated it in a way that we are, uh, you know, attaching a small, small topic and trying to break it down. So, uh, Tosif is going to present the first bit, which is the very straightforward exam question of, um, you know, how do you know this is a degen scoli and not an untreated adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. So, when a patient comes to you, uh, it's a 50-year-old lady with a scoliosis. And you need to, because both of, both of them are pitched differently. An untreated AIS is someone who's on, a, on that kind of a curve. While a degen scoli is on that kind of a curve. She's cascading and she's going to get worse very rapidly. So you need to identify that on day zero to decide whether you need to be on the fast lane uh, uh, treating her or you want to just go with her and watch her through. So, uh, if you understand what I'm saying. So, Tosif, can you uh, take over and tell us the difference between uh, untreated AIS versus um, uh, Dijan Skoli? Tosif, can you share your screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes. Thank you, sir. So, is my screen visible? Uh, yes, yes, Tosif. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm here to present how to differentiate uh, between untreated AIS from degenerative scoliosis. So it was started with Max Abbey, who has uh, 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 who has uh, classified the adult idiopathic scolo uh, scoliosis into three types. Uh, the type one is de new uh, new form. Uh, uh, it is primary degenerative scoliosis. Type two is progressive idiopathic uh, scoliosis in the adult life, and type three is secondary form. So. Uh, as we note, uh, the primary degenerative scoliosis or uh, the de new, uh, new form, uh, uh, it is basically due to the affection of disc or facet joint and it affects most of the structure asymmetrically. So it would uh, predominantly present with back pain uh, and either symptoms of uh, spinal sc uh, scanner stenosis, it could be either central or lateral canal stenosis. The progress, progressive idiopathic scoliosis in the adult life, uh, it is the continuum of uh, adult uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, uh, which either uh, exists in thoracic or lumbar spine, and it presents with secondary degeneration and imbalance. So uh, some of the patients in this group would uh, have no treatment, no uh, treatment in the form of surgery, or some of the patient had gone uh, the surgical correction. The third, the secondary degenerative scoliosis, it is divided into type A and type B, uh, uh, where uh, type A is associated with some secondary changes like pe pelvic obliquity, hip pathologies, uh, or secondary uh, to neuromuscular scoliosis. Whereas type B uh, is uh, with uh, the metabolic diseases. So to differentiate uh, the uh, untreated uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, with degenerative scoliosis, the age of presentation in AIS is early, especially in the second, uh, second decade, as compared the uh, pre age of presentation is in fifth to sixth decade. The females are more uh, affected in uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, uh, and uh, the curve is especially right sided curve. Whereas in degenerative scoliosis, the males and female affection is equal. The curve in AIS uh, could be either uh, thoracic, thoracolumbar, or lumbar type, with apex of curve is more in the thoracic region as compared to degenerative scoliosis, where 
the curve is mostly lumbar and apex uh, of the uh, deformity is either at the L3, L4 or L2, L3 level. Uh, the etiology of AIS uh, is uh, the uh, idiopathic scoliosis which is present progressed with mechanical bony and degenerative changes. Whereas in degenerative scoliosis, uh, there is asymmetric uh, disc degeneration and facet degeneration. The degenerative scoliosis is present with more symptoms like back pain, uh, the uh, symptoms of lumbar canal stenosis and uh, foraminal stenosis mm -hmm. uh, as compared to the uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Again, so, can you just go back one slide? Because in yes, this sir? first slide that you've shown, that this is really the crux of your talk where there's a differentiation. So when a 50-year-old lady with a curve comes to you, uh, you got to see if she is very symptomatic or not so symptomatic. Like let the x-ray not freak you out. Her symptoms. So uh, remember, Dijen Scoli is essentially an LCS. It's a typical lumbar canal stenosis that had come to you with all the lumbar canal stenosis symptoms. And there's of course a deformity on the x-ray and clinically. So her presentation is not deformity. Her presentation is degenerated uh, LCS, degenerative LCS. So of course, she's much more symptomatic. Then look, when you look at the x-ray, look at the classic pattern. So Typically, we know the classic pattern of, um, uh, you know, of, a, uh, of the curve types in AIS. So in Degen Scoli, that it doesn't fit in those classic patterns. You have the right, you know, left convex thoracic, like lanky, lanky types, kinks types, like that. So uh, look for that pattern. Um, everything else is theoretical. That it started in, at age 20, it started at 50. That's theoretical. Um, uh, you know, females are more involved. That is also theoretical. But these two are the first two footprints that should impress you when the lady walks into you. Go ahead, uh, uh, Tosif. Uh, so, cosmesis is always an issue in uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis as compared to degenerative scoli scoliosis which present at uh, lighter ages and with cob angle less than 40 degrees. Whereas in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, cob angle is uh, usually more than 50 degree at presentation. So changes of degeneration of X-ray like spondylosis, spondyloarthritis, and spondylolisthesis are more prominent in degenerative scoliosis as compared to uh, untreated adolescent uh, scoliosis. And uh, role of limited uh, uh, level fusion with decompression uh, is uh, uh, it is present especially in the low demand back uh, and. Uh, failed patient, uh, especially in the degenerative scoliosis, as compared to the uh, untreated as a, uh, adolescent scoliosis. To, so, to summarize, uh, the patient with degenerative scoliosis, uh, it presents with more symptoms, uh, more back pain, uh, more symptoms of uh, uh, lumbar canal stenosis, uh, and uh, uh, and it is uh, benefited with uh, the limited level surgery uh, in low demand bags. Uh, this is references from uh, for my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Tosin. That was lovely. And uh, can the others in the group uh, add a few points to what Dr. Tosif said? There are some very startling points that we didn't discuss. When you look at an X-ray, uh, that's the clue I'm giving you. What is seen significantly in a Degen Scully that's significantly absent in uh, AIS and vice versa. Sir. Uh, the AI has a significant uh, rotational component and uh, which is not there generally in a degenerative scoliosis. That's but is a very there important field? point. You will find significant rotations in AIS curves because that's how it started. Remember, AIS is a rotatory deformity while uh, degenerative scoliosis is a degenerative deformity. So because of degeneration and asymmetric disc collapse and facet arthropathy, you get degen scoli while uh, AIS is, starts with a rotation at the apex. Anything else? That's a good point with it. And sir, the other thing which you just said that the asymmetrical disc collapse. So that is one of the things that is the genesis of uh, degenerative scoliosis as against to uh, AIS where generally the disc is very significant with a lot of degenerative osteophytic changes, etc. Significant lateral listesis will be present in uh, degenerative scoliosis. Absolutely. Lateral listesis, lateral subluxation is the hallmark of degenerative scoliosis, which is not commonly seen in an AIS that's been neglected. And yes. Uh, loss of sagittal balance, uh, especially loss of sagittal the... balance, is a very important point that again is seen in uh, Degen Scoli, not seen in AIS. I hope all of you are making a note of of this because uh, these are the standard questions that are going to be asked, and it should come with your eyes closed, duk, 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 and you should never be, you should never miss it. 
Anything else? There's one more point I'm looking for on the X-ray. So apical, mostly Dijen scolies have an apical curve. It's not a nicely rounded curve. It's a curve like a collapsed, you know, it's a collapse that's gone off. So it's a pretty sharp curve compared to an adolescent idiopathic, which is a nicely rounded, a typical curve of AIS. So you'll have the apex where the bone has slipped out, lateral listhesis with a significant collapse, significant osteophytic changes, auto-stabilizing osteophytes on the concave side, etc., which you'll not never see in uh, AIS, which are... Uh, so that that's the game on this. Any questions on um, you know on the uh, on the discussion so far, or any comments? If not, then we'll quickly move to the next part of uh, of the talk. So I'm going to talk to you about why we should at all worry about uh, pa pelvic parameters, right? So um, the whole deal here is that pelvic parameter is a very new introduction to our like when I was an MS student, we never talked about this. In fact. Halfway into my practice, we didn't talk about it. It's the last 10 years that the whole world is suddenly talking about pelvic parameters. So the uh, big question is that, are we overdoing it? And is it an overkill? And does it really exist? And many of us old timers like to believe that this is just uh, in someone's imagination and it's not really an existing problem. And uh, hence, uh, we look back at our cases. So this is a surgery done uh, for me medium grade listhesis done 10 years ago. And we have a 10 and 15 year follow up with no sagittal imbalance post op, no ASD post op. So there was really something, and we never paid attention at that time. There was nothing like uh, sag uh, sagittal parameters. So we just went and did a T lift, and she's done well. Uh, forget this. There's a uh, here's the next case, which is actually a uh, Dijen Scoli, you know, an elderly lady with Dijen Scoli. Once again, we have a long follow up. Again, we've operated her without applying any of the modern principles of sagittal balance. And yet she's done well. She's not had any problem. So a cynical old man is going to say that, look, all this is your largest invest in inventing solutions when there's no problem to begin with. So why are you, uh, you know, uh, like splitting hair? But uh, then let me, so which is why I want to try and address this, um, you know, whole issue about what is the brouhaha about uh, pelvic parameters. So here's uh, probably one of the more interesting cases in my careers. And this lady had had a simple lumbar fusion for a degen listhesis, a very benign surgery for a benign problem in 2002 and uh, see what happens there forwards. Uh, by 2005, she had radiological ASD with, uh, you know, no symptoms. But um, by 2007, so keep looking at the right of your screen because the, the story adds on on the right. By 2007, she had developed a claudication. So now she was symptomatic. Mm. So by in 2007, she needed an extension of the fusion. So that's five years post the index surgery. She needed a re-operation and uh, that didn't, the story didn't end there. We have 2011 where things were reasonably okay, which is uh, four years after the second surgery. But at five, six years after the second surgery, you see a significant stenosis in the adjacent level. And uh, by this time, it was 2013. So we were uh, pretty much brainwashed by Ruzuli and his gang. And we said that, look, this is going on the second ASD in her short career that there must be something going on in the sagittal uh, parameters. And sure enough, when we got a standing x-ray that you see over here in this picture, you see all the parameters are off balance. Most typically when you draw the C7 plumb line, it's significantly off from the, uh, you know, the from, from where it should have been. This line, the sagittal vertical axis should have cut somewhere here in a balanced spine and there it's gone off. And when we tried to match her lumbar lordosis and the pelvic incidence angle, which was incidentally 57, uh, you know, you will find that um, uh, the lumbar lordosis is at, uh, sitting at 20 degrees is way off from the PI. And uh, we said that we must do something good. So we decided to do this operation and we took a wedge off from here and tried to give her a good lordosis. Uh, we may have not done enough because we were not so experienced, but we still did our best. And you will see the, you know, the plumb line, at least whatever you can see in this image, falling pretty much in the line of uh, gravity. And we thought that we are game set and match. So PSO, multiple SPOs, that's Pontes and fusion. But uh, within six weeks of that surgery, she cracked at the top. And this crack at the top is of course not coincidental. It's because there's a bad biomechanical axis acting here, which is pulling her down. And that's why the screws, which were snobbishly holding her back, held back and the bone gave way. So this is a, a very much a part of PJK or ASD. And uh, proximal junctional failure within six weeks suggests that what you did we're taking all the pelvic considerations in, in mind was not right. 
and uh, sure enough we had to b- keep building this uh, uh, antilla structure if you may and now we've gone up to uh, the upper thoracic spine and uh, you know there's no more spine to degenerate after this but now the spine at the bottom has started degenerating because the l5s1 is left uh, untouched and um, you will find that now there's a huge pseudo arthrosis there at this point i want to quickly bring in some uh, discussions because uh, um, uh, you know this whole thing if you see here in this image we have uh, you know from the beginning we've kept her l5s1 untouched and the cynics will say that you have to go to pelvis when you do a long fixation and uh, which is why i have pulled out this uh, useful article from uh, pretty recent cuz uh, there are surgeons who like to go to pelvis there are surgeons who don't like to go to pelvis and um, uh, you know the that's a bit of a uh, you know bit of a choice that we we are kind of prejudiced with but um, here's an article which will you know which kind of uh, supports my stand i typically don't like to go to the pelvis unless it's indicated and i understand that degeneration is going to happen below but if it happens we deal with it don't preempt it because the stakes are very high when you go to s1 and i like dr samir dalvi's comments on this or anyone else in the audience who uh, wants to think about it but this is a very uh, powerful group of doctors including shob and munish gupta and uh, chris shafari who have actually studied um, you know uh, patients who uh, where you've gone to s1 and patient or or ilium and patients who you've gone to l5 in degen scolies and if you see these groups are pretty well matched and they have a 6 week follow up and they never two year follow up and they conclude that uh, fusion and there's a good number of patients i i miss putting the number of patients here but it's a good study fusion to uh, s1 uh, involved longer operating times of course uh, higher pjk rates greater pjk angles compared to the fusion that stopped to l5 s1 or l4 l5 Uh, there were no significant differences in complications and revision rates in the two groups and they both showed significant improvements in uh, you know health related quality of life so there is some evidence to suggest what we are doing is right and uh, if samir is still available or anyone else rishikesh uh, anyone else in the group uh, priyank any thoughts on um, you know so on I, this and uh, the thing is you can't argue with uh, literature as you rightly pointed out you can't argue with literature especially at that level but um, if you ask me what is my thing i have seen far too many l5 s1 going bust for me to uh, not do it at that level um uh, some of the other uh, one of the arguments which indian surgeons always have is that our patients don't like revisions whereas american patients don't mind extending levels and uh, going ahead whereas uh, sort of our patients don't like it so for me uh, l3 l4 l5 if i'm fusing then i'm okay but the minute i go beyond that so if i'm going to l1 or anything higher than that so other than l345 which is two discs or you know two levels uh if there's anything more than that then i go then i cross the uh, l5 s1 and of course if i cross it today i would also go to pelvis got it because uh, going to only s1 also is a bit hazardous yeah and then you would do a interbody also so that is my uh, non uh, that is my... yes yes you put a put a cage So that is my non, uh, what you call it as, uh, it is. Uh, non. You can call it eminence-based medicine. Maybe yeah. not evidence-based. Yeah. Experience-based medicine. Sir, I have got a comment. Yeah, Priyank. Uh, sir, uh, by restoring the lumbar lordosis, you are essentially trying to get your sagittal parameters in order. But uh, by leaving the L5 S1 disc intact, you are still keeping a scope of kyphosis. We actually haven't really seen. uh after uh, our surgery of uh, restoring the lumbar lordosis leaving the l5s1 intact eventually how the global spinal balance was after we got the patient standing we it could very well have been that in spite of uh, you know taking care of the lumbar lordosis at the l5s1 junction the patient is getting crouched and that is probably causing more and more pjk yeah absolutely agreed i mean the whole debate is on that that if you leave the l5s1 disc unfused uh it will work against you cuz it will degenerate and collapse my thought process is slightly different that if the disc is uh, good to begin with i feel it's a corrective opportunity for the body afterwards it gives the body a leeway to readjust the uh, the toppling over it gives some mechanical leeway to the body like a hinge if the disc is good so if the disc is already busted or kaput i would fuse it but uh, i'm one of those who uh, at least in my hands I've, though i have not had great results with adult deformity surgery Uh, by leaving out s1 there have been less occasions like even this lady you know so here there's a quick article before I'm, we move on 
about which I read again a very new literature where they try to put BMP because the rate of pseudo arthros is very very high in uh, in these uh, adult scolies when you cross L five S one and you have to do an antibody and ideally put a small dose of BMP which will uh, enhance the fusion and make sure that uh, you know you get a fusion across. So just to go come back to this lady, if you see, you know, it's been five years after which her L five S one has started gotten symptomatic. So uh, we still could get five years on her. But uh, I understand totally that one. Any disc that has been left unfused is going to degenerate. I mean, there's no discussion about that. So the question is that: Are you doing good by leaving that disc and uh, you know uh, absorbing that degeneration, or is the degeneration going to get big on you for you need to uh, you know revise? In this particular case, it's gone really big on us. Even we don't know how to revise it. If you see the pseudo, but this lady is slightly special. She's got a bit of a uh, uh, you know those uh, Charcot kind of a disposition. In the entire body, and uh, this is almost like a Charcot joint here, which you will rarely see, and you will have seen a few cases in our coming for follow-up where we drop the L5 S1, not fuse it, and they're still hanging in well, as as she was for so many years. If you see her L5 S1 is unfused since 13, and it's only 19 that it's uh, you know it's really uh, playing a part. But this all brings us to the thing that Dubara Mat Puchna why to consider L5 S. Why these parameters are important? These parameters are clearly important, and if you don't get them right, you're going to have a cascade of events. And I'm going to try and declutter it in your head, as to I, as I did in my own head. So see, the spine is not a one single bone; it's a multiple blocks of bones which are stacked one on top of the other, and hence it has to balance itself well. Okay. Now the problem is that so when it when the column starts to collapse, all you need to do is get the column back. So if you think about it. If a column is collapsing, you bring it back, and everything should be okay. So it should not be so hard. The first problem that we face is that the base of this column is a tilted base. If you see the pelvis, the pelvis is not in alignment with the spine. It's a tilted base. So now you start thinking about a column with a base that is tilted, and now the column is collapsing, and you want to bring it back. You really need to match it with that tilted base. It doesn't then remain as intuitively easy. as uh, uh, as this picture you know where the base is a part of the blocks and you just get the block back on this so uh, getting it back in line whether from the back or from the front uh, becomes a challenge now here's adding to the you know to the uh, confusion that the base is actually tilted and it's not even a block it's actually a ball or it's a circle so again if you think about it the pelvis which is supposed to be the lowest uh, vertebral body is actually uh, you know moves like a, or it plays the part of a ball just like this uh, image shows rather than a block that is safely holding up the vertebral body so now the uh, problem begins to get more difficult because uh, when this block is rotated because we already said that this block is tilted it's not a block it's a globe or a circle which is tilted Uh, we don't know which way it is tilted because it's a ball so if it was a square or a block you know that it's tilted this way or that way but uh, the pelvis being a circle you don't know which way the tilt is and it doesn't uh, tell you you know so easily looking at it whether the pelvis is rotated that way or this way to to decide how you want to realign the column on top so if we could have some kind of a dial which could tell us which way the pelvis is actually rotated that would make things easy right so if the pelvis had some kind of a marker to tell us that the pelvis has gone backward or the pelvis has gone forward life would have been much easier now that dial actually comes from uh, the first set of uh, pelvic parameters that have been described and that is the sacral slope and the pelvic tilt these are the two first parameters and the whole idea of knowing these parameters is to know which way the pelvis is moving they are the dials like when a clock is moved this way and the 9 o'clock goes to the 6 o'clock you know that the clock has moved in this direction if the 9 o'clock has gone to gone to the 12 o'clock you know the clock has moved in the other direction so the sacral slope and the pelvic tilt pretty much behave like that so you see on these images on your right if the sacrum is sloping down the more it slopes down compared to the horizontal the more the pelvis is uh, rotated in the front the more the sacrum goes towards a standing sacrum which is a retroverted pelvis or a pelvis that's rotated in the front you know that the whole pelvis is moved that way so the primary um, aim of knowing what is the sacral slope is to know which way the pelvis is aligned and ditto the pelvic tilt because uh, the pelvic tilt is really the shape of the pelvis and uh, i did mention that the pelvis is like a ball but in reality is not a ball and all orthopedic surgeons have this uh, you know outline of the pelvis in their head 
so you can clearly know whether the pelvis is rotated backward which means the lower part of the pelvis is thrust in the front it's called a retroverted pelvis while a pelvis that's falling off in the front is called an antiverted pelvis so i hope so far it is clear so uh, the pelvic parameters give us a dial to decide which way the pelvis is now uh, as a at this point all of you must remember that um, a retroverted pelvis is bad news so people in whom the pelvis has gone off in the front which means their butts have flattened off their entire you know the lower part is facing up in the front that is bad news while an antiverted pelvis where the butt is sticking out is good news so the funda being that in a retroverted pelvis the base available so if you talk of a footprint available for of the base so the area between this uh, reduces because there's an overlap that happens uh, between the upper part and the lower part of the pelvis so in short your base is small and hence the an energy consumption is much more to uh, you know uh, for locomotion while in an antiverted pelvis the base has widened and uh, hence the area available for uh, it's like an eiffel tower when the pelvis is antiverted the eiffel tower has such a wide base that the top is going to be very very secure and balanced while if the base was very narrow the top would be unbalanced and the body would use too many muscles to try and keep it upright so i hope that funda is also clear that when the sacrum is uh, it also then matches with the sacrum that the, the more slope the sacrum the more antiverted the pelvis the more antiverted the pelvis the better it is for the patient the more vertical the sacrum or the more retroverted the pelvis the more energy consumption to balance the entire spine any questions at this point right so going ahead after we know this the plot further thickens because now we've sorted the pelvis we know which way the pelvis is uh, bent and so now we know okay pelvis is like this i'll need to put my column up like this so your base at least is sorted because it has a dial the problem is that the column that we are trying to resurrect in in our surgery is not not really a column it's a curve and this curve is of variable magnitude so it's not a fixed so it would have been much easier if there was just a line of bones but because there's a curve that has to be brought back and this curve doesn't have a definition someone's curve could be 10 degrees someone could be 20 degrees some could be 30 degrees suddenly we are now facing a situation where uh, everything is variable the pelvis is variable the curve is variable so there's it's like a blind leading a blind you really don't know which direction to go there's no constant here and uh, then how do you plan an operation that becomes a big problem right so if uh, my pelvic my pelvis was 20 degree retroverted and my lumbar lordosis was 10 degrees that may be my normal or that my normal could have been a 20 degree lordosis versus yours which is a 40 degree lordosis so there's too much chaos there there's nothing that's a constant against which you can lever your uh, your calculations and um, hence this kind of a situation happens because uh, now in this lady this doctor has got this lumbar lordosis really rocking at the end of the surgery but you don't know what her original pelvic disposition was or how it should have been or what her lumbar lordosis was for that matter and hence he's created a demon and she is actually falling over so these kind of results happen because there's no constant now going forward um, a, you know a bunch of brilliant french scientists realized that there is a constant in fact and that constant is the pi okay the pi is actually the sum of the pelvic tilt and the ss that's the angle of pelvic incidence or the pelvic incidence angle and this is a constant because this remains constant for it's your individual identity all of us it is now believed have a pi which will not change in life or death whether you're sitting standing bending jumping sleeping alive dead your pi remains your pi so now suddenly you have one constant to go with which means that you meet a person you check his pi and you can build the whole column on top of that pi because the pi gives you one constant to hold on to it's not like everything is variable i hope i'm getting across why why because the pi doesn't seem like an intuitive marker when you think about it are ye kahan se line draw karne ka and it's it looks quite a clumsy marker you see the thing in the bracket in the red see pelvic tilt and sacral slope is very intuitive you know you know you look at it and you know what we're talking about pi seems quite out of the hat but uh, the pi is is there because it's the first constant that was described and uh, you know this constant is in the general population at 
at uh, 55 plus or minus 10. The sacral slope is variable at uh, 42 plus or minus 8 and uh, uh, pelvic tilt is at 13 plus or minus 6. Those are the general normal values. I think this is what you need to remember. The general uh, PI, the angle of pelvic incidence. Now, once you have this, you find, uh, you also find that the relation of the PI with the spine is so close that the PI is within 10 degrees of your lumbar lordosis. So that makes PI suddenly a very star value attraction when you do measurements in the spine. And that is why the complicated pelvic incidence angle becomes your, uh, you know, your biggest star of your uh, assessment when you do sagittal parameters. I hope this is clear and uh, why to begin with PI was discovered or racked out or, uh, you, know, dis uh, you know, thought about. Uh, at this point, I want to uh, actually again break away and uh, show you another very interesting article that I saw where um, now there are two more alternatives to the PI. Uh, this is slightly deviating from the lecture, but this is a new reading. So I want you to see this. Just go look at that diagram. It looks a bit com complicated. Mm. The first alternative that has been suggested is this one. The C7 uh, vertical uh, tilt angle. Okay, so that's the angle that is the angle between the midpoint of the C7. So in a standing x-ray. So PI we know is slightly difficult to calculate. This is much easier to calculate. You draw a line from the midpoint of the C7 to cut the midpoint of the uh, sacrum of the S1 uh, end plate, right? At this point, this is the inflection point, so to say. So that is the red line. And then you draw a vertical plumb line from the C7. And this angle is uh, the C7 vertical tilt, which is also supposed to be a constant and has, is supposed to have a very close relation with PI. So it changes with the PI, but it is a constant for that person. So that is one new parameter that people are talking about. The other parameter before this that was spoken about is the global tilt. And it'll be nice if uh, at least you guys should uh, read about this. The global tilt is slightly more difficult to calculate, but uh, as you can see, it's the angle um, uh, you know, but uh, so let me try and figure out myself. But uh, it's the angle that uh, so you, you draw a line. So this was described before the, this is a new description by the Chinese. This is the older description by the, uh, I think by the European group. The line between the center of the hips to the center of the S1. Uh, and you measure that against the C7 uh, line going into the center of the sacrum. And that's the global tilt, which means the tilt of the pelvis versus the tilt of the spine. And uh, that is also supposed to be a constant. So the red line on top gives the tilt of the spine and the red line at the bottom gives the tilt of the pelvis. So uh, so just FYI, these are the two, two new indicators that are uh, uh, they're trying to use as challenges to the pelvic incidence angle. Um, right, so for a minute, I'm just going off and coming back in because any questions so far? So coming back to our uh, problem area. Oops. No questions, no discussion. Right. So now when you talk about the PI, you know that the PI is constant for everyone in their lifetime. And that becomes a good thing to hold on to. And you also know that the PI is important because once you know that constant value, you know that this person's lumbar lordosis should be within 10 degrees plus or minus of this PI. And that's how you can get your surgery right. For example, in this lady, you see there's a massive kyphosis in the lumbar spine. And um, uh, here, where do you start? So you start by first measuring the pelvic incidence angle. And that's the angle. For those who don't know still, it's the angle that's... You choose the midpoint of the sacral upper end plate. You make a line that connects that with the center of the hips. The x-ray should be such that the hips are overlapping. And then you draw a perpendicular to the end plate. And that is the PI. Now, this PI in this person is 56 which means her lordosis, which is today at four degrees or uh, whatever, I, I guess it's four degrees, um, should actually be between, uh, say, 46 and 66 degrees. So at this point, the surgeon can make a calculation that I'm going to do surgery in such a way that I'll restore this lordosis to match the PI value. And hence, his surgery has created, he's put cages, he's done an osteotomy here and created a lordosis that's so high that is from four degrees, it's come to 56 degrees and that is matching the PI and hence she's had a good long-term outcome compared to the earlier lady where all these calculations were not done. All right. So I hope so far it is clear. 
uh, while if you don't do this calculation you will find things going wrong as you keep finding in uh, you know a lot of patients that you uh, that you uh, you know that come for follow ups with you so the uh, what we learned so far is that in your surgery you try to match uh, the the eventual low doses that you are going to give the patient try to match it with the pi and you should be set right now is this enough so i'm going to add one more layer of chaos or confusion to our thought process and i'm going to tell you that the spine is we look at the spine we are spine surgeon but the patient has a whole body to talk about okay and now you look at this lady so um uh you need to know that aside of the spine there's a lot going on above and below and we are going to we still know only everything that goes on below today there is some more thoughts about what's going on at the top also but the below is the base so is there something even lower than the pelvis and that's what i'm trying to bring bring to your notice that when the lumbar lordosis so this is a serial diagrammatic representation of what happens in a degen spine so when your lordosis starts to flatten off because of degeneration so degeneration leads to discs narrowing down when the discs narrow down your lumbar lordosis starts to go away and you start getting what is called a flat back or a hypolordosis when that happens the body tends to fall off in the front if the body falls off in the front that is not acceptable because it's against the gravity principles and the first thing that happens is the thoracic kyphosis flat starts to flatten so the uh, it flattens and brings the center of gravity back i hope that is clear now after that the degenerative process continues in these uh, unfortunate patients and the thoracic kyphosis flattening is still not enough because the lumbar lordosis further flattens and the body again falls off in the front so the next thing that happens is the pelvis starts to retrovert and by retroverting it again pulls the center of gravity back is that clear so the first compensation happens above the lumbar lordosis flattening of the thoracic kyphosis the next is retroversion of the pelvis think about it it to pull the body back and um, if after that if the lumbar lordosis is still uh, you know overwhelming and still the center of gravity is falling off the hips start to flex and uh, so pelvic retroversion goes hand in hand with the uh, hip flexion and hence when you see your patient one of the easy ways to uh, you know to identify whether this is decompensated this is called a decompensated pelvis the meaning of decompensated is that all of our pelvis is have some compensation available to balance your spine but once the pelvis is fully retroverted it's busted its compensatory capacity so it's a decompensate beyond this it can't compensate and uh, the way to identify it is looking at the patient is of course a size of flat butts they have a very flat butt you try to ask them to extend their thighs you you know ask them to push their thigh back actively they can't because this is their normal at the most like when you want to push your thigh back you can get it there but this person will be able to get it back to here at best because her, this is her arc right her arc of movement has the entire dial has changed so basically uh, there's a limitation in the extension of the hip which tells you that the hip is that's a very easy clinical test to know whether the hip is retroverted or antiverted uh this brings the you know they bring the center of gravity back despite this if the lumbar lordosis is failing which means the lumbar lordosis keeps keeps uh, reducing with degeneration the next thing that the patient does is flexes the knee to pull back so all of you if you flex stand and flex your knees your center of gravity tends to go back so this is the last compensatory mechanism so i have spoken about uh, something that happens on top which will have a bearing uh, something that happens at the bottom which is at the pelvis which will have a bearing to your surgery and then something that happens infra pelvic which will also have a bearing with your surgery so here's a you know here's the uh, uh, it's a lovely photo it's from the book uh, you know which will show you the decompensatory mechanisms that have gone on in a given person uh, to try and keep the head up because uh, your your body has a right knee reflex which tries to hold you up in the vertical line and this is how it tries to do okay now how, what is the relevance of this to the surgeon right so here's a person who has a pelvic uh, you know pelvic incidence of xyz and the surgeon says i want to match the pelvic incidence uh, and I, i create a surgery where i've given a lordosis that makes the pelvic incidence equal to the lumbar lordosis as you see in this image right this surgeon has missed out all the compensatory mechanism especially the ones in the pelvis and below the pelvis so after he restores the lumbar lordosis on day 1 the patient stands up the pelvis tries to go back to its natural position because the natural position of the pelvis is not retroverted it's extremely energy con energy consuming so as soon as the pelvis starts to go back to its original position the spine starts to drop off and uh, as after that if the hips correct and if the knees straighten off the spine seriously drops off 
right? So the funda is that just matching the PI to LL is not going to be enough. And if you don't think about the lower parameters, which is your uh, the position of your pelvis, uh, retroverted or antiverted, the uh, angle of the hip flexion and the angle of knee flexion, and you don't add all this to decide how much LL you want, uh, you're going to be in trouble. I hope that is clear. Any questions or any thoughts? It's not very difficult to understand, but this is trying to de demystify it for you. So you, uh, the concept of balanced spine is a spine, as I said before, uh, where the C7 plumb line lies within a couple of centimeters from the posterior tip of the sacrum or the, uh, uh, the end plate of the sacrum. And you could be minus or plus, but within 2.5 centimeters is considered balanced. Uh, when you go more to on the uh, more in the front, it's called a plus or a uh, you know it's a plus sign, and when you go back, it's a minus sign. Uh, there's a balanced versus unbalanced pelvis, which is a funda you should know. So when the sacral slope is high, which means the sacrum is more and more flat, like horizontal, the uh, pelvic tilt is low, which means the pelvis is more antiverted, and of course there's no lumbosacral kyphosis. These are the characteristics of a balanced pelvis. While if the sacral slope is uh, is low, which means the sacrum is more vertical or standing up, the pelvic tilt is uh, high, which means the pelvis is retroverted. And of course, there is lumbosacral kyphosis, which means the angle between the S1 and L5 has become kyphotic. These are all characteristics of unbalanced pelvises. Uh, when there is an unbalanced pelvis, but a balanced spine, which means that all this is unfavorable, but in the end, the spine is balanced. In this situation, it is still a surgeon-friendly spine. So I'm coming back to my first slide where I said that we got away for so many occasions without looking at the pelvic parameters because most patients that come to us who uh, you know fall into this category, especially the listesis and the degen uh, uh, scolies, they fall into this category where their pelvic parameters may be unbalanced, but their spine is balanced, which is a very forgiving situation where even if you don't respect all the parameters, you can still typically get away. And it's only when the pelvis is unbalanced and the spine is unbalanced is where you will have a problem, right? So when you think of surgery, you think of the balance of the spine first, you think of the PI means the pelvic uh, balance also, and look at the compensatory mechanisms by clinically examining the patient and your realignment objectives are, uh, you know, getting all the three in, in line. And unless you get all the three in line, you can be in trouble. And here's one of our patients where, uh, uh, again, this was done before the time of, um, you know, uh, pelvic parameters, but retrospectively I've calculated and clearly I've not, despite doing a T-lift, which was a big deal at that time, uh, the lumbar lordosis is nowhere close to what it should have been. It's a clear cut mismatch. And sure enough, you see what happens uh, to this person, though, uh, you know, the, the debate is still out whether, because this guy after this x-ray has gone trekking to uh, Gungo 3 and all that. So whether this is, uh, you know, symptomatic or not is, uh, again, the jury is out. You can also see some pseudo happening here, implant loosening. So despite a bad surgery and a bad x-ray, he is asymptomatic. But uh, really PJK and ASDs, uh, the seeds of this get sowed when you don't look at these uh, balances. So uh, in the end, when you're thinking of re resurrecting your spine, think of all the spinal level, the pelvic level and the uh, sub-pelvic level um, indices. I hope uh, that was clear and enlightening. And if there are any questions, please ask. Uh, sir, uh, how significant do you think is rod contouring in uh, this surgery? Like if to make... So, the... You know, when, when we talk of restoring lumbar lordosis, so supposing at the end of my entire calculation, I've realized that I need to get a lumbar lordosis of 56 degrees. Okay. How do I know what is 56 degrees in yes, surgery? Comparatively, how can we and uh, that's anyone has any thoughts on how to actually measure that. So the only real way to measure it is to get a cobalt chrome rod, which is inflexible and, con uh, you know, curve it to 56 degrees. So the meaning of that is that the rod, so if the rod was a part of a circle, you know, if you take that part of the circle, it's, it'll show 56 degrees. So there are ways to measure it also, actually. And uh, today, if you really want to get it accurate, you can get a pre-contoured rod of 56 degrees. Once you know, because your calculations are done, in the big centers, they actually pre-contour their rod. So now if this rod is applied, it means that the uh, lumbar uh, curve has become free. So I think personally, rod is very, very important and the angle of the rod is very, very important and using a inflexible rod becomes important if you really want to uh, push your correction to uh, accuracy. And so why don't you do an measurement of the angles? 
uh one point is that uh, at the time of at the level of pso the local fluoro can help us uh and second i've read uh, in the literature that lot of guys do after complete correction they do a uh long film x ray there itself and uh, before the closure they uh, begin and second regarding rod contouring just on uh, that point uh, harshal the point that you made uh, like uh, intraoperative x rays i am not at all a fan of because it totally eliminates gravity and when you actually stand up the entire decompensatory mechanisms can come into play so you can have a rough judgment of where you are but it can't be and it too for scoliosis surgery in scoliosis surgery also intraoperative x rays may look fabulous but the minute the patient stands up she may fall off because gravity is getting eliminated so there is value in intraoperative judgment especially when you want to calculate your lumbar lordosis uh, as far as and i want to just take a minute more i just recently reviewed a very interesting article uh, on uh, someone who was trying to correct a um, uh, fixed ankylosing spondylitis okay and this person calculated made all the calculations based on the standing x ray pre op and uh, they calculated that he did a 35 degree wedge correction to get the ankylosing spondylitis curve back the minute they put the patient under an anesthesia and prone the patient there was an anderson lesion up here and that opened up and became a you know wide wide alligator mouth and that suddenly straightened the spine which meant that now your entire calculation went off because now your uh, you needed a very different calculation so in this situation they redid the calculations in the prone position and uh, got their angles right and they could get away by just doing a you know cage in the anderson lesion and it kind of auto corrected and now we know this that any ank spons who comes with a pseudo is actually a good situation because you use the pseudo to correct the ank spons we've done it in the cervical spine also yes so, uh, that's where again an introp x ray comes in handy what else were you saying harshan uh, regarding the rod contouring sir the rod contouring uh, typically at the proximal level uh over contoured rod are uh, known to reduce the chance of pjk as per the literature but that we will discuss anyways in uh, coming slides right so making a bigger kyphosis at the top so what right. is the dynamic structure also at the top like recently uh, i just read that uh, just having like dinesis kind of fixation at the top will decrease the nerves at the top, top. Uh, yeah maybe. so uh, it's called a soft landing so the one of the reasons for having a pjk is that the modulus of elasticity is so, so differential you had a strong cobalt chrome rod and a massively constructed spine at the bottom and the top is still an old loose spine of an old lady so uh, to try and match this an intermediate softer fixation in the form of either cables or a topping off device like a interspinous spacer or in our time we used to do uh, sub, uh, like a interspinous wire using a inter interspinous wire stainless steel to use it as a topping off device which means that between the hard spine and the soft spine there is an intermediate part which is trying to match the modulus of elasticity but this is a big fail so okay. it's well proven that these topping off devices and a very recent case harshal you can uh, pull out the x ray and show to prevent there was a young guy with a multi level ddd and we've done a topping off device to begin with and his third month post op x ray shows that put up the disc on top is kyphosing so it's a fail because uh, in the end at now this we used to do no this wiring we used to do when we did not know about these pelvic parameters now we know that ultimately it is a geometry and the biomechanics and the gravity that's going to decide pjk or not no matter what you do and i think we may hear about it from uh, uh, subhanshu any other questions or any other thoughts priyank samir <laughs> Munjal, so do you feel so cobalt chrome rod is useful in degen scoli where we expect osteoporosis? So that's again a very good question. That cobalt chrome rod uh, has a, a good advantage that it doesn't flatten when you start putting the rod in. So you, in the end, get the lordosis of the rod that you wanted to start off with. If you are to use a titanium rod, it tends to flatten. And in uh, Manabu Ito has shown that there's almost a thirty thirty uh, percent. loss of the rod contour after you actually put the rod in place in uh, especially in ais but on the flip side the uh, rod is so snobbish that uh, if the screw is not fitting into the rod so the the whole thing is that the titanium rod being slightly flexible is a release mechanism or it's like a pressure release valve so it'll uh, if the rod is if the screw is not sitting in the rod will flatten and accept the screw 
while in um, uh, so that's the X-ray of this uh, topping of device. If you see the last part, you see there's no rod there, and that is actually a cable. And uh, uh, this is called um, what's it called? Harshan, this system. Dinesis. Huh? Not Dinesis. Hybrid, Dinesis. Uh, hybrid, hybrid fixation, sir. Hybrid, no, but there is a specific name for this. The thing. name. Uh... Whatever. There's a rod below, and uh, there's an attached uh, thread here or a cable here, which is supposed to make this area mobile. So it takes the slack between the fully mobile spine and here, but you see it's not really helped. This is the three month X-ray. Thanks, Arshad. Transition rod. It's called a transition transition rod. It's a descriptive name. So um, uh, coming back to Munjal's point is that if the rod is very snobbish and you try and put it put you know attach it to the screw in an osteoporotic uh, degen scoli. the screw will start cheesing out and the screw pulls out because there's no adaptability both both will hold their own so the failure happens at the screw bone junction which is a far bigger problem than the failure happening which means that the whole onus is on the surgeon to release the spine well and do the osteotomy so well that there is no stress while you put the implant in so the minute you use a cobalt pump to make the stakes and you better do a really fine operation any any shortcut will end up with a failure well if you use a titanium rod you've kind of you know uh, done an adjust mardi kind of any other thoughts so that's why this lafage paper is very useful where they say age related contouring should be or age related parameters should be used yeah, rather than try to you know, talk about it uh, hold your comments munjal because harshal is going to talk about it that time we can open that discussion okay sir nene sir uh, one question aditya here yeah that uh so if at all we uh the case what you showed where uh, the uh, lumbar osteotomy was done to restore the pelvic para i mean to say lordosis and to get a uh, desired uh, pelvic uh, pi so in such where we are uh, uh, attempting any kind of osteotomy is it always better to go till iliac fixation so that we'll get proper good base on which we are putting up tower up so that was the debate we had just some time back if of course if this osteo see typically these osteotomies happen at l2 so uh, okay. or even l1 they don't happen at l4 or l5 so you still have a strong base if you stop at l5 like if i do an l2 osteotomy and i have good screws in 4 and 5 i'm still okay so the okay. whole debate about going to the pelvis <laughs> is uh, you know the pro and a con the just to some uh, you know bring you up to date with what we discussed if you go to the pelvis you have no discs available to degenerate anymore because you've busted all the discs so the issue of a degenerative uh, asd at the lower end goes away on the other okay. hand you've uh, kind of bitten the bullet which means that now there's no compensatory mechanism available in the spine the spine is a compensatory uh, structure but now you've fixed it so if you then get your angles wrong you can really fall off badly so okay um, uh, i mean it's there are surgeons and there are situations so you can choose which side you like to be but uh, so, I don't so think plan has to me has any bearing to going to the pelvis yeah so plan has to be decided case to case basis rather than having fixed ideas about anything yeah because especially because the osteotomy never happens at 4 or 5 it happens at l1 or l2 correct okay got got the points so, but there is some current uh, literature coming from issg g group that they are moving more towards the osteotomy that the apex and lower uh, and then that's why they say that whenever they are doing long fusions they typically tend to put uh, iliac fixation also yeah so uh, actually this is very true but for uh, ankh spawns so you know in ankh spawns the lower the osteotomy the better the lever arm you get so if you did an l4 osteotomy you have to do a much lesser angle correction to get the thing straight because you're farther away if you go higher there's a lesser lever arm but uh, uh, i don't know we, maybe we can talk about that literature at some point generally an l4 osteotomy is a i don't know samir I, if you're still there if you and most of us don't use that bone for osteotomy oh, i think uh, see for ankylosing spondylitis definitely not it's at l1 or l2 usually and uh, it's enough to get the correction i mean i mean at the most you may need to do two or you may do like a corner osteotomy is what, what is i do what which i do which opens slightly in the front and closes at the back but for the uh, although i you know i i i really don't encourage these surgeries but if you are doing these surgeries to restore lordosis for the uh, sagittal balance like in the, in this group which we are talking about in today's seminar then those are probably done at l3 actually l3 is the commonest level in where, where these uh, osteotomies are done um, 
right. as far as i know they, usually they are done at l3 that is the place where uh, the flat back has to be corrected that's the apex of the lumbar lordosis and that's where the lordosis is uh, restored also it's largely because the discs at l4 5 and l5 s1 are significantly degenerated or even l3 4 so you like to do a big fat lordotic cage there or do an anterior cage there and use the bone above it and keep you know this bone intact so we will talk about that article if uh, it come we get a chance later so uh, if there's nothing else can we move on ridai who's next oh, yeah so uh, sir i'll speak on uh, show offs classification just try and simplify it uh, as much as possible so it becomes easier to remember and write whenever is asking the exam right so show offs classification has come in very recently and it is uh, alluding only to these um, uh, degenerative scoliosis and it's Uh, because it's coming late in the day many of us are not so much aware of it and we don't use it in our daily practice but i think all of you guys in this generation will be you know when you see a uh, degen scoli this is right now the lenki of degen scoli lenki class we are degen scoli so that's why i think it is included uh, harshal is over to you uh, sir uh, you can the screen is visible visible okay. so i'll talk about uh, show offs classification decluttering it so uh, whenever a 69 year old female with claudication comes to us with as a degenerative spine and a affected quality of life the first thing that comes to our mind when we see scoliosis is lenki and uh, when we try and connect, uh, correct such a patient with lenki principles it ends up in a disaster so it's like uh, thinking that uh, these are uh, karelas we try to eat them as cucumbers and then complain that they are bitter because they are not cucumbers and here the main difference is that there is a coronal deformity and a sagittal deformity which both of which needs to be uh, taken into consideration so that is why swabs classification swabs srs classification came into consideration which takes into account the coronal curve the coronal uh, part of the curve and the sagittal part of the curve so we'll try and just declutter it and uh, make it more simpler as much as possible so when it is basically based on a 36 inch whole spine scanogram x ray and the ap is what defines the coronal curve and the lateral x ray is what defines the sagittal modifiers so when we see the ap x ray they divide it into the t which is at t9 and apex which is at t9 or anything above it and a l type where the apex is at t10 or anything below it so this is a t type curve that's an l type curve now when we have both the curves that are major curves that means that a uh, angle which is more than 30 degrees it's a double major curve as it's called d type curve and any curve 30 is a no curve technically and it's called an n curve these are graded as t l d and n and these are a few x rays for each kind of curve now when we see the sagittal modifiers uh, so when we see a lateral x ray this is what it comes to the first thing that uh, hits our eye on a lateral spine x ray scanogram is the lumbar lordosis then it comes to the pelvic relation of the pelvis to the lumbar lordosis as sir already talked about and to end it up is the global relation to it now the lumbar lordosis is defined as pi plus or minus 10 the pelvic relation is generally defined by the pelvic tilt is whether it is retroverted or uh, introverted pelvis and the global balance is defined by sva the sagittal vertical axis now the spy and they uh, define sagittal modifier as 0 plus and plus plus so just try and simplify it as much as possible now what happens so throughout the life the body tries to kyphose itself and all this try to make it as much straighter as possible so there we'll say that all of them are compensator so there's a lumbar compensator then the pelvis tries to compensate by retroversion and the global compensator so maintaining the global balance so the lumbar compensator is technically the lumbar lordosis which is defined as pi plus or minus 10 so we know that it is not an absolute value so here like image a which shows that the lumbar lordosis is pretty less as compared to an image b which shows that there is very high lumbar lordosis now none of them is abnormal both of them are normal because it has a relationship with the pelvic incidence so low pelvic incidence is a lower lumbar lordosis and a high pelvic incidence is a higher lumbar lordosis so both of them are normal 
uh, and here they define sagittal modifier as pi minus ll is to 10 10 to 20 and more than 20 so for example the first is pi minus ll is 10 we know that uh, the normal lumbar lordosis is falls between plus and minus 10 so it becomes a lordotic spine just for example if pi minus ll is 8 then lumbar lordosis comes to pi plus 8 which is a lordotic spine next is between 10 to 20 so pi minus ll for example is 12 that means the lumbar lordosis goes further down which means it becomes a flat back so that's why they call it a plus which is a worse situation as compared to a lordotic back and the third or the most worst scenario for this is the pi minus ll is more than 20 just for an arbitrary patient who has a pi minus ll to be 30 the lumbar lordosis goes further down and probably it can be a kyphotic back so which they defined as a more severe modifier it is a plus plus so after lumbar more compensated the next so gradually there's an increase in the worsening or increase in the severity of the uh, situation for the patient the next are the pelvic compensator here we defined it as pi is uh, as we uh, saw during the last talk the pelvic tilt denotes the pelvic retroversion so more the pelvic tilt the more is the retroversion of the uh, pelvis so for example this is a normal so they define pelvic tilt less than 20 with the normal as we saw it was somewhere between 16 to 18 so any pelvic tilt less than 20 is normal anything between 10 20 to 30 is mild retroverted pelvis a compensated pelvis with some hip flexion that can happen and anything that is more than 30 becomes a severe form which is a severely retroverted pelvis maybe an uncompensated spine which can cause other issues like a hip flexion and a knee flexion so after the lumbar lordosis and the pelvis the next come is the global sagittal balance which is defined by the sva so sagittal vertical axis which should I, which is generally a line that falls from the c7 vertically down and it should be touching the posterior superior corner of the sacrum so anywhere between uh, but till 2.5 anterior or posterior is considered to be normal. So here they define less than 4 to be normal because it is a compensated spine. So it is ahead of, it is not at the place where it has to be. It is in front of it, but the spine overall looks compensated. So they define it as 0. The SVA, which is 4 to 9.5 centimeter ahead of the posterior superior corner, is a partly compensated spine with a defined S plus. And more than 9.5 centimeter is a decompensated spine. So they define it as a double plus. So to sum up, this is what happens. The first is the lump, uh, uh, spine gradually worsens from a lordotic to a flat back to a kyphotic spine. The pelvis gradually from a normal anti watered pelvis becomes more and more retroverted to a vertical pelvis. And the global balance which looks as a balanced spine becomes partly uncompensated to like completely uncompensated spine. This is a falling forward spine. We see a kyphotic back and also notice the flexion of the hip and the spine. So this defines how they define the severity in the sagittal plane. So to sum up, uh, Schwab's classification includes the coronal curves as and the pelvic the sagittal modifies defined as the lumbar curve, there's a lumbar lordosis by PM and SL. Going down the whole spine, sagittal balance by SVA and the pelvic tilt by PT. So to be a more clearer, we just take an example. Uh, anybody to volunteer for this? So we'll tell Shubanshu or to volunteer. Uh uh, for for the curve, it is uh, lumbar curve. So it's uh, lumbar curve. So yeah. on the lateral X-ray, the first thing that we see will be is the SVA. Uh, we need to calculate the angle actually, but yes, the SVA yeah, is yeah, we can either calculate the angle on an X-ray or we yes. have uh, surgery maps which can help us in calculating the angles. So uh, here the lumbar lordosis to see is a minus 43.4 because it's a kyphotic spine. That is why it's a minus sign on a lumbar lordosis. So PI minus the so PI minus LL is coming to 23 is the PI and a minus 43 for a kyphotic spine. So it comes to 72. 
which is uh, plus plus two. That means the kyphotic spine. The PT is twenty nine. That's a plus, which means it's a retroverted pelvis. And the SVA is, seems to be falling somewhere around four to nine point five centimeter, which means it's falling forward, but looks overall compensated. Uh, so. This means this shows that is a degenerative scoliosis with severely kyphotic spine, which is defined by a PM and a CL. However, overall compensated, and this shows that it has the worst quality of life for the patient, and we would need a surgery for this. However, the Schwab's classification does not prescribe a treatment as in what to do, when to do, how much to do. Uh, this has a very good clinical correlation with the patient, like a worse uh, on a Schwab scale will be worse clinically. It helps us to plan surgery that should be go to us for a simple surgery like simple one or two level T lifts to work extensive like uh, vertebral column resections or uh, multiple PSOs or fontis, and also helps in predicting the outcome. So it's like both cucumbers and karelas taste good if they are prepared properly. Thank you. Nice. So that kind of. Uh... Uh, does it, did everyone follow? Because it's a bit complicated, but you have to put all the thoughts that we built up so far from the first and second talk to try and uh, you know get your head onto this classification. Maybe uh, eventually you should share your talk with everyone. Uh, maybe you should share all the talks with everyone. Is there any specific questions that are you know that are not understood? Uh, anyone in the group don't consider yourself too junior, Mansi. You can. You are also allowed to ask questions. Are there any comments about the validation of the classification? So uh, here, the only problem of the classification is that there is a lot of description that uh, how the we cannot know the treatment protocol based on the classification. There is a lot. Uh, the intra observer variation is pretty good. Like it is a classification that helps us to communicate between uh, different doctors. That's what we said, rather than uh, planning the treatment. So it is actually validated by multiple studies and multiple centers across the world. So and uh, SRS has adopted it as a AO SRS classification. So right now it's the go-to classification, but uh, as we uh, as we discuss now, there are a couple of more classifications that have come in because uh, this classification does not uh, talk about the levels of degeneration, the symptoms of the patient, the age of the patient, etc. And uh, there are two things that you all should definitely know about. Sorry, I'm going to again, uh, you know, get this, uh, share the screen and show you. So the one thing that the whole world is talking about right now and that you cannot not know is this. The Turkish guys gave it. It's called a gap score. And uh, I'll try and share you the article which uh, gives this gap score. It's the, it published in the JBJS in 2017, I think. And this takes into, uh, you know, takes into consideration... The relative lumbar lordosis, the relative, uh, you know, uh, lordosis distribution, you know, L45 versus L5S1, the age of the patient, the, uh, you know, everything relative. So the gap score at the at the end gives you whether, uh, you know, there's a proportion, disproportioned or moderately disproportioned spine and tells you, you know, what sort of surgery and what sort of uh, result you're going to get more than uh, the surgery. So uh, the gap score, it's uh, the global, um, what's it? Yeah, you know the full form? So why don't you global? Global, global alignment and proportions. For uh, gap score. So that's one thing that you need to know. And the other is, uh, you know, this uh, other classification that uh, Le Martina has proposed, which is again a very useful classification. Mm -hmm. Actually, you going to talk about it? Probably not. No, sir. No, I'm not. Uh, yeah, I'll put it on the group. It's a two zero one four classification. It's quite different from the um, uh, from the um, classification of Schwab. And again, it takes into into consideration um, the amount of degeneration, the symptomatic DDD, and uh, of course the balance of the spine. So it's worth worth at least knowing in the back of your head, so you can you know work uh, work your thought processes around it. Uh, so next, uh, Subanshu, we will talk about the risk factors for PJK in a uh, adult lesion spine. Uh, my screen is visible. 
yeah uh, my topic is risk factor uh, uh, causing proximal junctional kyphosis and uh, uh, what is proximal junctional kyphosis is uh, uh, one of the challenges situation which an uh, sur spine surgeon faces when operating in an adult spine deformity cases and it is defined as a proximal junction sagittal angle more than 10 degree or at least 10 degree greater than the preoperative measurement it is calculated by drawing the line along the cephalate end plate of the uiv and uiv plus to upper end plate and uh, proximal junctional failure uh, which is a more uh, more uh, more different variant uh, than the proximal junctional kyphosis uh, includes the structure failure mechanical instability leading to uh, listhesis and uh, other failures uh, the incidence of proximal junctional kyphosis is around 20 to 40 percent which is very high and which leads to worsening of the sagittal imbalance vertebral collapse and neurological injury that's why uh, the risk factor for the proximal junctional kyphosis in adult degenerative scoliosis needs to be kept in the mind uh, while operating in such patient. We have done a literature review uh, specifically including two uh, meta-analysis and one review article uh, published in AOSpine, Global Spine and Orthopedic General Journals. Uh, the risk factor can be divided as a patient-related, surgery or surgeon-related uh, or radiographic parameters. The age is one of the uh, patient-related risk factor. Uh, more than 55 years of age is the cause of increased sagittal imbalance and also with the age, uh, disc degeneration, muscle atrophy and facetal degeneration are said to be the cause of PJK. Also the low bone mineral density, which is the uh, cause of increased stress at the screw and the bone junction uh, causes the PJK incident, increases the incidence of PJK. The radiographic parameter includes preoperative uh, sagittal vertical axis more than 5 cm, which causes the increased stress factor at the UIV and LIV. Also, the post-operative greater correction of SV, uh, sagittal vertebral axis. As uh, there are many studies which have shown as the age progresses, SVA also increases. So, uh, they, the study has given us that as the, the correction should be done according to the patient specific factors, including the age. Also other parameters include thoracic kyphosis more than 40 degree, uh, lower pe uh, preoperative lumbar lordosis or greater correction of lumbar lordosis. Surgeon related complication includes aggressive muscle dissection, which includes the uh, upper segment uh, dissection of uh, facet joints and the posterior ligamentous structure, which makes the spine unstable also pedicle screw at uiv is more causes more stress at the proximal junction when we compared it with the uh, uh, hook uh, transfers uh, hook uh, hook system at transfers uh, uh, or laminar hook. Uh, also the distal fusion at the sacrum and pelvis said to increase the pjk risk pjk risk but uh, since uh, uh, fusion at the sacrum and pelvis give a rigid fixation which uh, uh, which kind of topple the spine in the upper junction also th since there are no uh, movable segment in the spine it increases the movement at the upper junction and which might lead to pjk also there are study which shows that chrome use of chromium cobalt rod increases the time duration of developing the pjk compared to titanium and also Surgical technique like rod cantilever technique with multiple uh, Smith Patterson osteotomy increases the risk at proximal junctions. Uh, to sum up, all these risk factors has to kept in mind while of, uh, while doing the surgery uh, for correction of the adult spine deformity, uh, especially at the proximal level. Thank you. Excellent. Any thoughts or additions? So we talked of surgeon factor, surgery factors and patient factors. Yes, sir. All clear? BMD becomes the biggest enemy because all of them have a bad BMD. Uh, the thing is that the spinal BMD gets misread in an adult scoli and invariably the value is much better than the actual quality of the bone. And you have to look at the hip or the wrist BMD to judge preoperatively. And some centers actually give uh, six months of fortio pre-op before you even take these guys up for surgery. Not only because of bone stocks, but because of also uh, muscle mass to get yes. the sarcopenia in order. Because one of the risk factors is poor muscle mass. 
and uh, Harshal had a paper. What what was that paper about fatty replacement of? Uh, yes, sir. The uh, there are multiple papers uh, quoted. Basically, uh, some of the papers quoted for a posterior spinal fusion, and they have studied on MRI the uh, quality of the muscles, and uh, that we are going to talk in my slides also. That uh, the muscle atrophy or fatty infiltration of the muscle is significantly more for the erector spinae compared to the anterior muscles. So we lose the muscle tone posteriorly. And there's a difference between proximal junctional kyphosis versus proximal junctional failure. And uh, that is something that people are now talking about. And um, also symptomatic versus asymptomatic. Because the asymptomatic uh, percentage or radiological percentage is much higher than the clinical percentage. So uh, you've got to think about all those. Sorry, uh, Abhay, what is the difference between failure and kyphosis? I mean... Uh, Subhanshu? Basically... Uh, Sir, so the P, uh, PJK is the uh, ky uh, kyphosis occurring at the proximal junction and it should be equal to or less, uh, equal to or greater than 10 degree. While uh, with failure, it should be more than 15 degree with uh, structural uh, structural and mechanical instability. Basically, like they could uh, be like and, a uh, or yeah. a, you know, discitis kind of an infection or a screw giveaway, which is not all included in PJK. PJK is where everything is fine and the uh, upper level is toppled over. So failure happens at multiple levels. Kyphosis that happens only at the uh, uh, disc facet level. Then also the clinical uh, association with a radiological kyphosis would be a proximal junction failure. Correct. Failure is uh, usually considered as a clinical uh, presentation. Any other questions? Right. So let's move into Harshal's uh, talk. Uh, my screen is visible? Yes. Sir. So basically, uh, I'm going to talk about pelvic parameters today. And uh, why this topic is because after a wonderful decluttering of pelvic parameters and uh, Schwab's classification, we all tend to feel that uh, we understand the entire thing and uh, we can plan a surgery. But there are multiple more factors uh, associated with it. And why cynical perspective is because uh, this is a war between uh, uh, ISSG group and ES ESSG group, the Americans versus the Europeans. Uh, and they are all having their own uh, parameters and factors and corrective maneuvers and surgical decision making. But for our Indian perspective, we have had a big follow-up of our mentors cases where we have seen that uh, plain decompressions and small surgeries, limited fusions have given wonderful results. So that's why the cynical uh, perspective. And uh, coming to basically adult spinal deformity, but why we should know about it is because it is uh, in India around uh, in 2011 census, there were 104 million people about six years of age. And it is proposed that by 2025, we'll have more than 175 million uh, elderly population. So incidence of adult scoliosis will be definitely more. It is one of the most disabling diseases for uh, elderly population. And uh, when we talk about cost and health related costs, it, it, uh, it is very significant. And now because of so much advancement in spine surgery, this uh, increasing tends towards aggressive surgical management and complex fusion. And uh, there are a lot of papers, a lot of literature available, which says that uh, the surgical management is far superior for uh, adult degenerative scoliosis, specifically the degenerative scoliosis. But it is not with risks. We have talked about PJK and there are multiple more, a plethora of risks which are associated and complications associated with these surgeries. And there's a significant lacunae in understanding about the pathogenesis of the problem. There's a multiplanar uh, evidence to this problem uh, where we have lacunae in radiological parameters, lot of papers from earlier A lot of uh, papers uh, are uh, still coming uh, from different different uh, parts of the world re regarding new radiological parameters. And we don't know the clinical significance of these radiological parameters. We do know is there is an importance of balance and equilibrium. We have learned from this cone of economy by Debussy that energy conservation is significantly important for health, quality of quality of life. 
and their recent literatures from uh, 2018 and 20 uh, 20 and even 2021 which are available which says that achieving a good balance is very important for health related quality of life and we have talked about all these spinopelvic parameters and newer measures also sir describe about c7 pelvic tilt uh, sacral tilt uh, and global tilt but are these to be taken as a gospel we have a sra shop classification it just simplifies that pi minus ll uh, should be within 10 degrees of each other but we are basically looking at the solution first then finding the rationale and then looking at the problem and that is where we should understand and take it with a pinch of salt and there are a lot of literature as we discussed that it is coming from american and european group now this is a very recent review of literature from jns and spine and uh, uh, the neurosurgery uh, journals that 2021 2022 or 2018 uh, 2020 that health related quality of life indices and spinopelvic parameters have very less or very weak preoperative association and this one paper from uh, chong suli and uh, js park they say that even post operative clinical outcomes and mechanical failures had no significant association with a pill mismatch uh, we must go through this literature and we have had a lot of initial work after the Glassman's initial paper in 2005 regarding uh, PI associated with AS, ASD or adult spinal deformity, a lot of significant literature uh, work has gone through uh, understanding the biomechanic of uh, am, am I audible? Yes, Arshan. And uh, P. Rusoli from France has given this uh, wonderful classification between, between spinopelvic uh, alignment, sagittal alignment, and he has given this uh, four types with low PI as uh, type 1 and type 2. And uh, I'm not going to go in details of this classification, but one must go through it. And in recently, in 2020, he, uh, he gave a, a new classification or a, just a minute, sir. He again uh, divided this and gave it what should happen in a degenerative pathology. And he divided these into 12 groups, type 1 going into uh, kyphosis and ASD, type 2 going into kyphosis and ASD, type 3 going into kyphosis and ASD, and type 4 going into kyphosis and ASD. And he has defined each and every uh, type of spinopelvic alignment and uh, how they progress to uh, adult spinal deformity. Recently, he has added one more class, uh, the type 3A or type 3 anti-verted. And is, there are now five uh, types of spinopelvic alignments which are there uh, now. Which means you're trying to say that they're saying that, that PI should match LL. That principle, uh, what we discussed, is not universally applicable. It is not universal. We'll go through it. We'll, we'll uh, get into that also, sir. Sorry. So the first point, according to Rusoli, that uh, when he defined a new class, the type 3A, he also told that how many percent in his study, he had around 600 uh, uh, individuals. There are 16 percent in this new group. And this is a group which has high lumbar lordosis despite low pelvic incidence which doesn't actually uh, suit what we have learned uh, over the last uh, few years that typically high PI is associated with high lumbar lordosis. So this is, there's a discordance in it. And when you try to correct this, typically we end up in a problem. So in this case is what he, he had, we have to do in this example, we can see that the lumbar lordosis was reduced and that increased the pelvic tilt and that achieved a uh, global settle balance. So 16% is a quite a big number. And we know that our uh, revision rates or reoperation rates or PJK rates are ranging between 20 to 40%. And that's why this uh, European spine study group, there are multiple papers will find that what they are trying to do is not PI minus LL. They are trying to classify each curve into what curve it, it falls into Rusoli curve. And now uh, their surgical strategy is to get that back to a normal Rusoli curve, either type 1, type 2, type 3 or type 4. And uh, the results are excellent as per their literature. 
Second point is lumbar lordosis. What we don't understand about lumbar lordosis is first measurement. What we grossly measure lumbar lordosis between L1 to S1, but there's a even deeper concept with inflection points and short and long lumbar lordosis by a concept of spinal segmentation, which is given by Barthomon. And that typically aligns lumbar lordosis in a upper lumbar lordosis and lower lumbar lordosis. And there's a significance to it also. The distribution of lumbar lordosis, typically we have to understand that the, excuse me. Uh, the, the lumbar lordosis, when we talk about low PI, average PI and high PI, the in a symptomatic individual, it is typically constant between 35 to uh, 37 degree, uh, degrees of lower lumbar lordosis. And the upper lumbar lordosis varies significantly from 16 degrees to 30 degrees. And this should be important in surgical corrections. So when we have a patient with high PI, our osteotomy should be such that we properly distribute this lumbar lordosis because that is going to have a significant impact in our uh, clinical and radiological outcome. So this is an example. Uh, the, the image on the right, which is on top, is a uh, index surgery and a proximal junction failure. And then when they corrected the lumbar lordosis at L4 osteotomy, they got a proper uh, sagittal balance. The third key point we're talking about is patient specific nuances or patient specific factors, the age factor, the neurogenic compression factor and soft tissue factors. We know that aging is a kyphosing event. We have heard this over a period of last uh, two speakers also. Sacropelvic parameters varies with age. We, we don't have a constant PI also. PI also varies with age and it has been proven in literature by multiple authors. Sagittal balance and Ability to compensate also varies. Younger patients have a higher demand for sagittal correction, but they have a better compensation available. Whereas elderly, we have to be quite clinical about correction and their compensation mechanism is very limited. And uh, Lafagia et al has given age adjusted alignment indices. We must also know that uh, Lafagia et al has given this that with each decade, PT, PI minus LL and SVA varies by certain degrees. It is given in his paper. Why it is important, as we have discussed, that under correction of age adjusted alignment by many authors has been proven that it has a poor health related quality of index. We have to understand that elderly has a poor compensation potential and they have a rigid spine. Also, we must know that effect of posture on spinopelvic uh, parameters. We have discussed that earlier in a brief that spinopelvic parameter on an X ray can be very different from that what we have when patient is lying prone for surgery. And that's why uh, sometimes CT or MRI films can be quite helpful for us. We have a scout film. It will be quite helpful for us because it is done always on supine position and patient has been lying down for almost 20 to 30 minutes. So he has that muscle relaxation and uh, those can give you a quite idea that how a patient is going to be uh, on the surgical table. And also what we talk about PI minus LL uh, within 10 degrees doesn't stand true for high thoracic kyphosis. There's a different formula altogether, which is given in a, a, a nice paper. On a top, we can see two images, a 30 year old, 38 year old male and uh, with an 89 year old female, both having same PI and same LL, but for them age adjusted alignment is significantly different. Coming to compression, we all know that neurogenic complication, uh, compression or lumbar spinal stenosis aggravates crouch. And when that crouch gets aggravated, our spinal uh, pelvic parameters go for a toss or we have an uh, uh, undue problem in calculating parameters and difficulty in planning. And that can sometimes lead to surgical overcorrections and surgical overcorrections as one of the most prominent causes for proximal junction failures. Uh, and that is what we have learned over a few years. Coming to soft tissue parameters. When we talk about age and muscle volume, typically with age, the muscle volume goes down. We know, but fat infiltration is one more factor where we have seen that lumbar spinal erector has a greater fat infiltration at almost 45%. The second greatest is there in hip and extensor, which is around 20% and very minimal lumbar 
for uh, the fat infusion happens in abdominal muscles so you have an anterior stronger abdominal tone and posterior weaker abdominal tone and that can be one of the cause of progressive crouch or progressive forward imbalance we have multiple literature uh, a lot of literature available right from 2007 where uh, uh, they had studied about the posterior muscle masses on an mri after posterior spinal fusion surgeries and they have found that 27% of uh, cross section is reduced after fusion distal to the fusion and 2% proximal to the fusion and that can be one of the cause for proximal junction failure when we have talked about uh, psf with t lift we have found that uh, there is a significant denervation of the muscles and that can also be one of the cause for proximal junction failure and uh, it can affect health related quality of life and index and coming to adult spinal deformity surgeries uh, this is a paper by hun in 2016 and they have found that whenever they have pjk in 38% population they had smaller erector spinae and significantly larger fat infiltrations so take home for this uh, talk is spinal pelvic parameters have weak association with pre op as well as post op clinical measures specifically health related uh, quality of life there is a poor association by literature between mechanical failures and pjks with spinal pelvic parameters we have to always ask a question that is pi minus ll is an over simplification of saddle correction parameters and we must always assess every curve individually patient and surgeon factors which we have discussed earlier and equip ourselves with current concepts and also age muscle tone and neural compression are important factors for clinical outcome and surgical decision making thank you sir excellent harshal actually the whole idea was that see for fellows who have to give an exam no the discussion until dr harshal's talk was very relevant because that's the what the world is following and you need to know the names the numbers the definitions the angles and the thought process but uh, in clinical practice uh, you know everyone will agree that the complication rates of these surgeries despite doing everything are extremely high and one of the reasons for that is that we are still following a relatively ill, Ill understood concept and uh, i mean the simple thing is that all of us when we grow old we start having a flatter back but in surgery we are aiming to give you a back that is an 18 year old's back based on the principles of uh, you know of uh, schwab's classification and that itself is a challenge because you are you are like putting a ferrari engine in a fiat car as we famously say so you you are not going to win the battle unless you do an age matched operation and of course a disease or a requirement matched operation so i think that is the bottom line and this i think talk was very very uh, eye opening to give you the other side of the story and the whole world is thinking like this is not just that we we put this talk here because the whole world is beginning to uh, feel that we are doing an overkill by following those rigid uh, principles and angles and we should tone down somewhere <clears throat> any questions or thoughts we really busted time but i'll quickly uh, did i should i we will just go uh, through uh, yes, few yes. more cases. cases more than cases no it's like a uh, decision making basically yeah, uh, practical yeah. yeah practical decision making like uh, you know this lady so this is the prop the uh, good thing is that every young patient does well so anyone who is you know in the 50s or 60s who comes with degen scoli no matter what you do they'll do well and it's really the uh, problem the challenge is that they come to us at a much older age so uh, this lady is come with progressive uh, claudication and back pain and uh, the box on the left tells you what are the questions that come to your mind should i uh, operate if i op because these are invariably very disabled patients they are not the ones who they are come they come demanding surgery or demanding some solution they are not the types who will accept your ha do dawa lo ye ko they are like disabled they are uh, you know it, it's unbelievable how how much uh, their complaint box uh, you know how full their complaint box is so um, you know they come with the problem so here's the disparity that the patient will come to you with back pain functional disability leg pain and claudication and uh, we as surgeons we look at it in a very different perspective we look at the coronal plane deformity sagittal plane deformity lateral lesis stenosis you know what is the walking distance what is the nsaid intake so our our uh, assessment is very very objective and very uh, you know linear and when the patient comes with a very different problem and expectation and they don't realize that they have achieved or they have re uh, reached this place after a cascade of events and we uh, you know we see the end point of that cascade of events and we want to try and convert it back to zero 
in uh, you know one go and that's the problem so the first pearl that a clinician must know is that you're not going to treat the x-ray you hear the patient symptoms out because uh, your patient is quite different from the standard scoli patient as uh, they mentioned or uh, subanchu mentioned or sorry tosif mentioned right at the start uh, they have uh, clear cut differences between uh, the average scoli patient that you see and this specific elderly means old adult degen scoli patient and that's the entire lot of things that are seen which uh, you th- you have to think about before you offer treatment okay so don't treat it as a scoliosis look at it as a complex lumbar stenosis so that's the other very important thing that every time you see a curve your eyes light up but think about it as a complex lumbar stenosis and you will find your answers so here's a specific case uh, 66 is relatively young for an adult scoli it's one of the favorable age groups to treat and she comes with um, long standing back pain with reduced walking distance which is what we call a compensated stenosis with a severe right thigh pain since one month making her adl difficult so um, what do you do what would you be thinking subanchu here like how what is your thought taking you towards uh sir it seems to be a uh, degen uh, degenerative scoliosis uh, no sir uh, there is a rotation uh, rotational uh, rotational thing in the since the pedicles are not visible it seems to be a as kind of thing AIS, to, this is a well maintained Rotation yeah, are, rotational and the disc space are all maintained. Okay. Maintained all. So uh, no, in this clinical scenario, so like I said, don't look at the X-ray. Look at the patient. He's come with a one-month history of significant thigh pain. Since the history is very uh, is uh, acute, uh, we are thinking about more like a disc or uh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely so you have to first ask her that were you okay like 3 months ago you still had that set of complaints back pain and claudication but were you comfortable then and uh, you know is so if she says that uh, sure enough your mri will show you that specific pathology now it doesn't mean the mri is showing no other pathology there's clearly an lcs there's clear there's an osteoporotic fracture up there but there's a disc that's causing her a current complaint and your best bet is to uh, you know do less in this scenario uh, so uh, the questions of course that will come to mind are, are all these so should you deal with back pain so the golden rule is that there's no surgery that cures back pain so if back pain is a problem try to not treat it with surgery at least and uh, if you decompress will the patient uh, so you decompress and do a nerve surgery will the patient be okay with the residual back pain that's a question you got to ask her because her back pain has not suddenly increased it's a leg pain that is thigh pain that's increased how much bone to remove during decompression your worry is that when you decompress your further destabilizing so um, that, that's that's one more thing that you want to answer yourself and then uh, if she comes at 76 10 years from today asking for fusion will you have done her harm so um, there are some natural history uh, papers which tell you what are the you know predictors for curve progression and higher magnitude curves older age lateral lysthesis rotator subluxation and osteoporosis none of these seem to be the factors in this particular case but you got to think about this uh, these are likely to progress and uh, uh, if these factors are not so the progression is not necessarily linear just because at 66 she has a 20 degree curve it doesn't mean that 76 she is going to have an 80 degree curve so that's again what you got to think about so in this specific case doing less is better i think all of you would agree with this and uh, you know the big question is that i do a decompression now but she comes with a degen scoli which needs a big operation at 75 don't do preemptive surgery because if you do a big surgery now she may come with a vjk you know in 2 years so uh, it does you're not kind of solving any problems so just deal with the trouble that you have on hand and this this is the easiest way to treat a degen scoli patient you address a, address the symptoms do a small operation and live to fight another day <clears throat> all right so ra- rarely does a patient with long standing symptoms present for surgery rarely do such patients have a specific localizing overwhelming pathology and they rarely do exceedingly well so these are like the golden uh, pearls that you got to remember and if you can identify the cause and treat it then you're in a better you know better place right 
so then the question is if you need to fuse should you do an apical fusion or go long and the whole worry about apical fusion is that if you do an apical fusion like this the spine may topple over either in the ap plane or in the lateral plane and um, that is the big concern otherwise apical fusion seems like an easy way out so just do a short fusion and get away and uh, uh, of course you don't want that kind of a thing now here's a patient who was young and uh, he had can anyone the can ridai comment on this sir the this looks like a young patient but uh, the spine is quite degenerated there is a osteopathic uh, spur formation with uh, asymmetrical disc collapse at uh, l3 4 level and also a uh, coronal plane deformity or scoliosis uh, also it, the lordosis has been obliterated with uh, the significant disc degeneration and uh, but the lcs is not that uh, bad on an x ray with two level small disc that are there so patient has back pain that is uh, because of a degenerated back with some leg pain so here just doing a decompression may not just suffice because the young patient is a long so all you say that is helpfully it's not an ais not a ais right? so that's a very very important point though it's a young patient you may want to think it's a you know he has had some is issue here or some incident here in the past clearly that has led to a rap because everything else looks normal so there's just one apex so this follows all the criteria there's an apical scoliosis like an angular scoliosis not a rounded scoli there's hardly any rotation there's a significant asymmetric degeneration of the disc huge osteophyte on the concave side so everything matches a degen scoli so even though it's a 52 year old there it's a degen scoli so i think that's one thing said Uh, this person has back pain and leg pain so just decompression it's not an overwhelming leg symptoms like the last patient so you will have to think about resetting his back now he's a young act or she's a young active person so it's legit that she's come uh, you know asking for treatment and you want to uh, you know want to treat it so uh, i guess it's fair enough to you know offer offer treatment now coming to treatment uh, um, riday what was your thought process so sir uh... when we treating we like will try and restore as much uh, as possible yeah. so we just cannot fuse a l4 l3 4 level uh, we need to at least uh, address the lumbar curve so that we can restore the balance there is significant this degeneration at all the levels uh, that is there so uh, L two to L five uh, fusion with like a, uh, like a short fusion one, rather than a short, short, short fusion fusion with a one level T leaf at the apex. Yeah, the, that's roughly what we've done. Of course, this is way before the time of uh, these new thought processes. Again, this is the early two thousands. But what you can see here, no, is there's a very favorable sacrum. The sacrum mm -hmm. is quite horizontal. The pelvis looks nicely antiverted. So these are very low demand cases. Even if you think about the you know hips being here. the pi or the uh, you know that's also pretty wide and nice it's not a narrow pi situation it's a wide pi sloping pelvis sloping sacrum so here even if you don't get it absolutely right it's very very forgiving and we, we must have a at least a 15 year follow up on this guy and even though if you you know today if you criticize these rods are quite straight the lordosis is really not that that much achieved you can get away uh, for three reasons one is that it's a young person the second is that um, you know the sacrum is pretty sloping and the pi is pretty wide i think all these three things will make your surgery quite full proof even if you get it wrong okay and there's some interesting thoughts on this that uh, when you look at the decision making in degenerative scoliosis age and trait age of the patient seems to have a big big bearing on the decision making in uh, age of the surgeon sorry has to, uh, has a big uh, you know thing on the de decision making and older you get the less aggressive you get that's the basic funda because... funny that you should funny that you should say that but <laughs> for that last case i would have done uh, i mean i i would uh, need to find out also what was the real cause of the leg pain whether that l34 was responsible for the leg pain it but, was yeah. pretty matching the l4 nerve root you don't know one right. level yeah so i would have done just the l34 actually Correct. because Correct. i think if you i would have just corrected the apex and left let the others be uh because if you leave it just like that this is going this would have gone uh, gone into like a worse scoliosis i'm not denying that 
but i wouldn't have uh, gone that one above and one below either i pretty much I agree know. with you today i would also yeah. do one level because yeah. it's and because the other discs are, I mean, this is a, one of the very rare cases where i wouldn't think much like i i hate to instrument these cases actually my philosophy is totally different but uh, this is one which i wouldn't mind because the other discs look pristine and this is really just a single segment degeneration and it's a single segment uh, uh, stenosis and a single segment deformity so this is ideal for doing just that one level and plus he she is young so i would have done that i also agree that whatever correction we've got is only at that one level so the rest yeah. i think was so a... your age also slightly more now than then right <laughs> yeah totally this was almost 15 16 years ago today i agree i would have just tackled the apex and like dr dalvi said rightly you know leaving this behind is uh, you know a formula for problems later is a good opportunity is like a hemi vertebra you know you tackle it at that right time and the spine will fall into place if you leave it as it is it will take the whole spine along with it but i think this was an overkill because uh, though it's you know stood it doesn't mean that if you had not done it it would have not stood because the discs are also pristine and this is not a classic multi level degeneration sir in in that patient when you see the mri uh, so the mri does so the affected levels which were fused at least so there is some maybe degeneration on the black discs so we won't consider that here i you would not want to fuse for black discs here yes you know the disc height is well maintained the disc contour is well maintained if you just cover so much you know if you cover so much and just look at this this looks like normal this yes. looks like normal so the uh, verdict is not out but i definitely today when i look back i would have done a, if this person presents today it would be a one level but and see, i would do i would do it mis okay yeah because there's no true decompression also needed so again i think that's so one, a, if it's one, also it's one side yeah. if it's a one sided leg pain yeah. and then i would do for whatever it's worth muscle preservation or whatever it is i would do the mis because it's, it's a easy it's mis is for the old lift guys the old lift as well old lift yeah. as well yeah it's a great case for them but you don't get these that often you know these yes, that's what i'm saying it's one of the rare cases which i would operate so here's the other uh, you know uh, significant literature of course this is some time back 2010 but it's again by some of the best authors so when they compared a huge bunch of patients who and some underwent decompression alone some decompression with limited fusion some decompression with long fusions the ones who underwent decompression alone uh, had a fair odi improvement but when you asked them will you have the same surgery again they were not so happy so their actual result of surgery was not as good because the expectation mismatch was there they didn't meet the but complication and morbidity was least while the group 3 where you went the whole hog the ones who did well were absolutely happy but uh, you know the complication and morbidity was significantly high so when you go for the whole hog it's clear that you're biting a bigger bait you're raising the stakes much more and it's uh, you know hit or miss and uh, you know that you got to discuss with the patient because these are all true results from two true centers and that's what you find in your um, you know on your in your practice setting also so here's the thing that that this this person did well because there was a good uh, you know good uh, alignment of standing x rays and you got to not miss the standing x ray so the next time you someone like this comes to you in your clinic you're not going to look at the scoliosis you're going to only look at the kyphosis for the kyphosis you want to get a standing x ray including the hips and because you want to see the alignment of the hips you want to make them do a hip extension maneuver to see if the hips are still flexible at the behind or they're locked in flexion because that will all help you determine you know how how much harder you want to bite at the cherry or you want to just go soft and uh, you know bump off the patient in some way or the other right and then we spoke about the balance etc and you got to see all these uh, you know all these fundas so uh, you want to not miss the spinal balance and the pelvic balance and um, i'll just get, take you to the next case so like this lady once again done i think we showed you this some time back once again here it's a low end curve this is a uh, can anyone hazard on saying whether this is degen scoli or an ais it looks significantly degen there's almost no rotation as you can see and there's a significant disc degeneration osteophytic formation a very low low end curve it's like a very low curve and there's a significant lumbar stenosis at all levels so here you could get away sir would probably just do a long segment decompression but here again uh, uh, you know we didn't have a, we don't have a very long follow up here but uh, it's long enough follow up this is actually samir your classmate's mom who lives who right 
that uh, that I'll tell you later. <laughs> okay. That I would have. I also would have known. Who comes to our New Year parties? Now her mother-in-law is. Acha, that Vinny. Yeah, yeah. Her mother. Okay. So this, uh, I, but I would have also done only a decompression for this. Not a fixation. No, most likely. I mean, I I don't know whether this is a standing. If this is if this is a standing X-ray, then. If this is a supine X-ray, then I would have taken a standing X-ray. No, no, it's standing. If but standing X-ray, then I am not impressed with the. I am not impressed enough with the uh, <clears throat> with the curvature, with the deformity part of it. Uh, and at seventy-seven, I will say that I don't know about the back pain. I am operating you for the leg pain. Right. So I would have just done a decompression. Uh, sir, can can we just get a point here? Uh, yeah. Uh, like what Samir sir said, how how many times has your decision making been influenced by a supine standing X-ray? Supine or standing? No, both supine AP and standing AP. I think today I will definitely do a standing X-ray yeah, uh, because today when a patient like this comes, no, you don't call it a degen scoli, you call it a degen uh, kyphosis actually, and the only thing that matters to you is the sagittal balance or the kyphosis. And I would uh, definitely want to see a standing X-ray. Yeah. No, but I'll I'll see here again. Here again is the one which uh, you know I, I don't think one can really talk so much about even the kyphosis even this. So now here they don't have a lateral standing X-ray yeah, only exactly. because it's a it's an MRI which is there. But uh, you one must also understand that part of the kyphosis or the crouch is because of the stenosis. And after you uh, correct the stenosis, they actually stand much straighter. So you can't just you know look at a patient who comes to you slightly crouched and bent over and say you want to correct this patient by just decompressing this patient will auto balance. So whether to do such a big operation which is with its own different levels of failure and levels of complexity and levels of thinking because then again like if I want to operate this patient I have to sit and read all these articles I have to uh, see this whole webinar all again from the beginning. So what are the various indicators blah blah blah. But whereas if you don't so there is one. Uh, one one line although it's not ending yet a conclusion for this uh, entire webinar on degenerative scoliosis is that you need to know all of this or all of this is very important if you are doing any fusion if you are not doing any fusion it does not matter what the pelvic parameters are it does not matter what the balances or what the imbalances so your entire thinking of what to do how much to correct how much lordosis to give how many levels is only if you are actually you if you are not fusing you just don't get into that Yeah. You don't need to get into that at all. So, sure. and that the problem is that this thing is going. See, why I'm not excited by this is because the that whole like a lot of thing in medicine they go round and round in circles and then they come back to the first square by the time you have you are on the third square. You know, so what happens is the whole thing goes round and round and round and then they come back to saying, oh sorry, sorry, we were all wrong. So then those who then follow that, I ended up leaving a whole trail of mistakes behind. So I'm not saying that you are making that one is making mistakes by fusing these. But I'm just saying that this knowledge is evolving too much. They also don't know what's happening. They are like chasing their tail, and biology completely beats all of this. So biology makes you lose every time, whether it's osteoporosis, whether it's poor muscles, you know, whatever it is. Biology always uh, beats you whenever you're trying to win in these cases. So that, that's all. But anyway, that is too much philosophy at this point. No, no, but I don't but know. Back, here, but I think you're sounding absolutely spot on. because what you said is actually absolutely spot on and you are able to you know uh, put it in words it's great but the crouch bit we all know and harshal discussed it that uh, there is a physiological kyphosis and a structural kyphosis so the physiological kyphosis gets missed because of the crouch and the you know compression priyank you were saying something no no sir i, I, know, I, I was very really impressed with harshal's presentation it was very mature actually yeah that topic was itself uh, you know a game changer now what about this one This is a 55 year old, so again a relatively young person. Uh, this looks like an AIS which has gone yeah, into degeneration. Yeah, neglected, neglected. Yeah, yeah. significant rotation. But um, the question is, will you go L1 to L3 like an apical fusion? Will you go T10 to L5, or will you go the whole hog? Uh, assuming that this person has enough symptoms demanding surgery, you see, there's a short yeah. list. This is happening there also at four five. Yeah, no so the question here is that or oh, does he have lumbar stenosis or is are we operating for the scoliosis or are we operating for a lumbar does he have stenosis at l4 l5 and l5 s1 because that would be important i think we are all over the place in this one i don't yeah, know yeah because then you treat it like a you treat it like a scoliosis you can't go short in this that's for sure yeah. you can't do just a very short one you have to treat it i think what you did whatever little x ray i saw is what i would have done 
So like a T10 to L5 type. So what about the S1? Like this is the one, no? Where because honestly, I these X-rays and all, I think not matching up. It's all uh, all over the place. But this is the one where I would want to leave the sacrum behind. Yes. What is the age? It's 55. There's a good disc here. No. So I will tell this patient that I'm going to do you to L5, and 15 to 20 years down later, you're going to need to be extended. But yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Will leave you. yeah. Fair enough. Because 15 to 20 years, the whole life changes. You know, the whole world has changed. There may be something very different available for that. So even if she, if if my surgery holds on for five or seven years, I think it's a good uh, good win. Uh, Priyank, you have any thoughts? No, I agree with you, sir. Yeah, okay. again, these are cases that Ole for lateral approaches are like really good at because we would end up doing like Benita's mother, you know, end up doing a three-level yeah. T lift. It's a fifty-five-year-old; they'll manage it well. But an elderly person like Benita's mother. Yeah. We have a lot of blood loss, and uh, we lost a patient, uh, Samir, recently. A similar one. Okay. I mean, three four months after surgery, we lost her, but uh, blood loss was a lot, like one and a half liter during surgery. We did three level T lift. We got mm-hmm. the entire X ray bang normal, like a great lordosis, great uh, coronal correction, but the heat that the patient took was very high. It was very really similar to this. So um, here, Olive would have, with minimum blood loss, corrected three levels beautifully. The anterior lateral approach. and after that you do a long posterior correction the other option is a staged operation if she, if this person was a 77 year old you go in do releases do um, you know screws and come out and go in another day after three or four days and do your interbody work and correction and that's another option uh, i think these so, are the two options here so the only issue is uh, considering anterior approaches like olefs and xlefs in uh, a degen scoli Versus a neglected AIS. In a neglected AIS, there is uh, because of the rotational deformity, the 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 location of the soas and the uh, the art, and the arteriovenous uh, like the aorta vena cava, the rotation there is a distortion as far as the normal teachings are concerned. So the chance of complications are much higher than a regular degen scoli. Have you read about this? Yeah, uh, not read about it, but uh, at Cardiff they used to do a lot of X lifts. and when they used to do a lot of x lifts the people who were a uh, proponent of x lifts they were a little skeptical uh, doing x lifts in patients with uh, neglected ais uh, as compared to doing it in patients with uh, degen scolies okay because it's again counterintuitive because in the uh, you know, scoliosis is the easiest case to learn your anterior approaches because the spine is a good morning spine you open and the spine is looking at you all the vascular and bad structures have fallen away so if you're actually approaching from the convex side it's a good morning spine and it should be actually quite easy so Correct. it's intuitive unless these guys have been approaching from the concave side yeah, of so what right. they used to specifically do is then they used to get mri cuts at every section and then they used to uh, kind of uh, make a note of what angle they are going to get into that uh, uh, safe corridor so that and that specific have uh, done anterior surgery and directly been doing o lifts yeah i think because you know like i said intuitively it should be a no brainer to just get in because you just hit the spine straight away correct sir in benita's mom's case also we were actually almost tempted to do anterior surgery yeah. because she was to go a uh, uh, surgery for her abdomen that time correct so just a few articles before we finish there's a nice article this is like 5000 cases uh, which are studied for wound complications and the 2.5% uh, incidence of wound complication in these patients and the uh, factors that uh, you know that increase the rate of wound complications are posterior fusions obese patients uh, pre operative blood loss i mean peri operative blood loss of course a poor asa scores in operative time that's uh, longer here's a very interesting article again from a, a very strong group where um, uh, you know there's a loss of basically they've uh, looked at the loss of correction in a in a adult scoli patient and the loss of correction at the end of 2 years can be very very high so 61% patients lost their sva of that magnitude almost 5 cm 65% lost their pt you know uh, of again 4 5 degrees and uh, the whole pi to ll ratio 40% people lost to the a magnitude of 20 25 degrees and uh, the risk factors were again comes back to the same thing that people who have um, you know a worse a uh, pre operative sva so poor spine balance where you done a massive correction they are more likely to go back to where they came from 
and um, uh, strangely this is a new thing that interbody fusion seems to because interbody fusion suggests that you've done more uh, uh, has a higher likelihood of uh, uh, ll loss and there's one more good article i would uh, this is the kickstand and tie beam procedure which is being now extensively used so there are two things that are being ex extensively used one is that if you cross the l5s1 junction you add an extra rod so a double rod construct versus a quadruple rod construct they have shown a significant uh, you know lower rate of pseudo arthrosis so they say it's not biology it is mechanics that causes the l5s1 pseudo arthrosis so now when you go beyond uh, between l5s1 you try to put an additional double rod and when you are trying to correct an asd kind of situation as seen in this case this is called a kick stand which means that you correct the kyfo uh, correct the coronal deformity and then do an additional concave rod to pull things together and distract slightly and a tie rod or a tie uh, tie rod is a rod that comes here in a similar way and it pushes this inside and i'll try and share the article on the group on the kick stand and tie rod and um, um yeah that's that actually that's that's the discussion so uh, any thoughts otherwise we should be good just one point sir that whatever we have discussed today is just we have barely scratched the surface of the literature which is available and for adult tegen scoliosis is n number of articles for every specific point so and we almost at least fellow level and early level we should know this because these cases are going to come with age increasing and population absolutely so uh, you know any more discussion is Uh, welcome, but I don't know who's going to bite the bait because this is all I know about adult scoli. So someone else who wants to pitch in because you know the collective experience has been not high. We are in India not doing that kind, that level of surgeries that the Americans are because our patients are lower demanding. But um, I don't know of too many guys except the Olive guys maybe maybe doing a little bit more. But honestly, Olive cases are very very selective. Like Olive is not a panacea; it's not applicable across the board. It's app applicable to a small group of patients. so um i still don't think we've threaded the needle as far as adult scoli is concerned right so if there are no other thoughts or questions we can call it a day and uh, grab dinner right so thank you so much and we'll quickly announce our next uh, seminar and samir thank you for you know sitting through and giving giving us such invaluable inputs because it uh, you know adds to the collective uh, wisdom of everybody so it was a very uh, everybody spoke very well i think all the thought process of the, whoever spoke has been very clear so yeah and actually this helps us read more and think more about things so we'll try and pick up another controversial topic the next time also so we'll try and keep it abreast with uh, you know what we don't know try to fill the gaps so thanks this time, this time abhay gave me 10 minutes notice so i couldn't read <laughs> next time give you at least 15 20 minutes notice Hello. Thanks a bunch, and see you all soon. Maybe Saturday or Friday or something. Cheers. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you sir. Thanks Thank a you. lot. Thank you. Thank you, sir.